spirit boards. Hey, look what I found! Why I haven't seen one of these for years? It's a Ouija board. Ouija, the mystified oracle. We're consulting the spirit board. How do you play it? Anybody there? No. Concentrate on the question. Rest, Rest your hands on the Everybody conscience. puts one finger on this. Let the spirit Just like me. guide on them. Is anybody there? Spirits? Can you hear us? Is anybody there? Ouija boards, more generally spirit boards, were around long before they became a plot device in horror films. Their roots go back about 50 years before the name Ouija was ever even used, to 1848, to the beginning of the spiritualist movement in America. We discussed this topic at some length in episode 11 and 12 back in October of 2018, but as a refresher, we'll go back to that cabin in Hydesville, New York, where one spring night, the two youngest children of the Fox family, Catherine and Margareta, began communicating with an unseen entity, one later understood as the ghost of a murdered peddler buried in the cellar. It all began with a series of rapping sounds. The girls responded to these noises by inventing a game, asking the spirit to knock in response to questions, once for yes, twice for no. But you can only get so far like this. And so the girls came up with the idea of calling out the letters of the alphabet and waiting for the spirit's knocks to choose letters to spell out particular words. Eventually, the foxes grew uncomfortable with the attention they were receiving in Hydesville and fled to the home of an older daughter, Leah, in nearby Rochester. The knocking spirit seems to have tagged along, and under Leah's enthusiastic guidance, the girls began to welcome the attention. One of those drawn into their circle was a Quaker by the name of Isaac Post, who, in the presence of the visiting spirit, began to channel messages with pen and paper, supposedly unconscious of what his hand was writing. And we'll leave the story there, around 1850, and avoid any unpleasant details of presumed exploitation or deception. We needn't go further, as we already have what's of interest. Two early methods of communicating with spirits that shaped the future of spirit boards. The first being the possibility that a spirit might choose letters from a series first a spoken series and later printed, and the second possibility that the spirit might move a pen unguided by the hand holding it. Now, a little context on the spiritualist movement that uh, sprung up in the wake of the Fox sisters. What we might now regard as a pastime for credulous mystics was actually influenced by the 19th century's growing tendency to value science over traditional religion. Spiritualism emulated the empirical process, requiring evidence from the other side, beginning with those responsive knocks and later demanding more elaborate proof, slate writing, floating trumpets, and the production of ectoplasm. And this evidence was to be corroborated by witnesses those assembled in seance groups. The celebrated trance mediums from whose bodies spirits famously spoke were those who had risen to the top of a movement with a wide base consisting of very American do-it-yourself home circles, families, friends, and neighbors gathering to talk to the dead. Lacking the trance mediums, theatrical abilities, They typically engaged in something called table tipping. 
That is, sitting around a small table, hands pressed to its surface, and awaiting a sign. A knocking of the table legs against the floor, a tip or a turn. Signs not only answering yes or no questions, but responding to letters of the alphabet called out. The table's movements collectively and unconsciously produced, or supernaturally if you prefer, compares obviously with the movement of the planchette, the pointer, over later spirit boards. Since we've already heard of spirits picking from an array of letters to spell words, you'd think that printing letters on a board and providing a pointer to point them out would all be very straightforward. But in fact, the first pointers or planchettes, uh, that's uh, French for little board, by the way, were not used with a board printed with the alphabet. They served as a mount for a writing instrument. Just imagine a vertical pencil stuck through a modern Ouija planchette as the sort of third leg or where the circular window is. That window, in fact, may be a vestige of the pencil's earlier placement, given that the common heart or teardrop-shaped planchette already seems to have a tip with which it might point. In fact, once planchettes began to be used to point rather than write, many, if not most, planchettes did not have that window or used to. I should also mention that the planchette is often referred to as a table, as in Ouija table. That was especially in the early days when table tipping was more remembered and the planchette was imagined as reflecting this practice in miniature. Devices for collective pencil writing were mentioned as early as 1853 and were originally improvised with small upturned baskets with a pencil thrust through the bottom. While it was the American practice of table turning on which the planchette was modeled, it was Europeans who first produced purpose-made planchettes, the early models used for writing, of course. The devices made famous by American spiritualists were introduced from France, hence the French name, but they were also made in London in the 1850s by Thomas Welton, a fabricator of artificial limbs married to a seer of some sort, and Welton's were soon copied by other game and toy makers in the city. But the planchettes introduced to America were discovered in Paris in 1858 by a visitor from Boston, the social reformer and legislator Robert Dale Owen. During his test run of the device, he claimed to have received messages from his deceased father, in the old man's handwriting, no less. So he returned home with several of these little wonder workers and the desire to introduce his countrymen to his discovery. Robert Owen loaned them to a bookseller friend, G. W. Cottrell, who quickly produced 50 duplicates for his store, and soon what was called the Boston Planchette became a thing, and by 1868, Cottrell was even selling a booklet touting his creation, entitled Revelations of Planchette. Not a planchette, mind you, just planchette as a proper noun or a name for an otherworldly being. There's another 1868 book by American journalist Kate Field called Planchette's Diary, in which she describes first hearing the word planchette and a friend saying, Everybody is going crazy over her. Is she a woman? The author asks. Woman? No, indeed. She's a board. A board that runs about on wheels and thinks and writes and swears like a trooper. And yet throughout the book, Planchette, who keeps the diary, as the book's title makes clear, is treated like an independent intelligence. Field's initial assumption that Planchette's writing is produced unconsciously by the user is denied by a more experienced seance-goer who says, Planchette writes about matters of which the persons present are not thinking, and of which they frequently know nothing. A number of pseudoscientific theories of the day, presuming to explain its actions, are bandied about, 
including later iterations of mesmerism and something called Odic Force, named for the Norse god by German theorist Baron Karl von Reichenbach. No single theory is settled on, however, a general unwillingness or inability to explain the phenomenon prevailed generally. Spiritualism was still in its free form, pre-doctrinal state, and hadn't become an organized religion at that point, and kept company with those engaging in scientifically flavored psychical research. Reflective of all this is the title of an 1869 book by the Bostonian author Epps Sargent. Planchette, or The Despair of Science. And a uh, particularly important text published in this era was an 1867 article simply entitled Planchette, which appeared in the British magazine once a week. A full six pages complete with illustrations recounted the author's experiences in northern Scotland during which an all-knowing planchette reveals to seance participants various unlikely revelations. The article was widely syndicated throughout the U.S. via the Associated Press and generated countless letters from readers demanding where they could acquire this miracle device. Cottrell's operation in Boston suddenly had competition in New York from Kirby & Co. booksellers. Hundreds of ads for their planchettes can be found in newspaper archives, with copy often taking a dig at the competition, like, Great Modern Mystery, Planchette, the only reliable one sold. While Cottrell only offered the classic Boston planchette, Kirby came out with constantly updated models, including one made of India rubber and one of glass. Even inspired a Cincinnati music publisher to release a song, in sheet music form of course, Planchette Polka, with a cover dedication to Kirby and Company, complete with his address on Broadway to facilitate easy planchette purchases. However, Kirby himself had competition during that boom year of 1868. N. Bangs Williams Toys in New York released their Insulated Planchette. And in Boston, Gilman Moulton took a bite out of the market with their Electromagnetic Planchette. In the next decade, many more pencil writing planchettes appeared with names like Scientific Planchette, Psycho, the Baffling Psychic, The Mystic of Mystics. The Mystic Artist. The last shaped like a hand with pointing finger. During the 1870s, there was a slight dip in interest thanks to exposés in newspapers with titles like The Three-Legged Imposter and Confessions of a Reformed Planchettist. But in the next decade, something new began to capture the market, something the New York Times in 1886 reported on in an article entitled the new planchette. New in the sense that it had done away with the pencil and now was being used simply as a pointer. And with that came the requirement of boards with printed letters. The article identified spiritualist communities in Ohio as a particular hotbed for the usage of the new planchette. One of the popular models in this new style, produced by the W.S. Reed Toy Company of Massachusetts, was given the name... Witchboard. While those namesake 80s and 90s horror films were still about a century away, Reed's product made some press for itself when in June 1886 one was presented to President Grover Cleveland as a wedding gift, along with a note suggesting, It may be of service. Cleveland's letter of thanks was published in several papers of the day. Dear Sir, I acknowledge with thanks the receipt of the witchboard. I shall admire it, but I shall not at present test its power of disclosing the past or foretelling the future. So, Grover Cleveland was not a witch. Witchboard. Don't play it. Alone. One of the readers of that 1886 New York Times article was presumably Charles W. Kennard, 
a fertilizer salesman in Chesterton, Delaware, whose business had recently fallen off, giving him more time to experiment with this new planchette thing, eventually leading to the creation of the Ouija board. According to a letter Kennard sent for publication in the Baltimore Sun after the Ouija had become a sensation, it all began with Kennard penciling letters and numbers on an old cake board. But there was another collaborator, a neighbor of Kennard's, a Prussian cabinet maker turned coffin maker, E.C. Reicha, who also claimed to have created the initial prototype. Whichever the case, Kennard convinced Reicha to fabricate a dozen or so models for sale or demonstration. But then coffins always need making, and Reicha refused Kennard's request to manufacture an untested commodity on a large scale. Moving across the Chesapeake to Baltimore, Kennard managed to find an interested investor and attorney by the name of Elijah Bond, who suggested some minor changes and wrote up a patent request. As for the product's name, Ouija was never a conjunction of the French and German words for yes, as is often suggested. Company literature attributed it to Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters Nosworthy, a spiritualist and successful medium often called the mother of the Ouija board. It was Helen who conducted a seance during which the board was said to have named itself, spelling out O-U-I-J-A. When asked the meaning of this peculiar word, the board again spelled out Good luck. So goes company lore. But it's also been noted that Nosworthy habitually wore a locket with the likeness of British author and activist Maria Louise Sorme, who went by the pseudonym Wida. So, only a letter off, a D for a J. We don't know. It could have figured into the name, though. Nosworthy is also credited with success at the Patent Office in Washington, D.C. The chief patent officer is said to have demanded proof that the board worked before signing off, asking as a test that the board, operated by Nosworthy and Bond, spell out his name, which was unknown to the applicants, supposedly. Of course, Ouija came through, which became a selling point in Kennard's advertisements. By simply resting the fingers of two persons upon the small table, it moves, and to all intents and purposes, becomes a living, sensible thing, giving intelligent answers to any questions that can be propounded. Wonderful as this may seem, the Ouija was thoroughly tested, and the above facts demonstrated at the United States Patent Office before the patent was allowed. The Kenner Novelty Company was apparently onto something, popularity of their particular version of the new planchette skyrocketed, and a genuine Ouija mania was born. However, one widely syndicated story describes the downsides of all this. Here's a particularly detailed version of the account that appeared in a Pottsville, Pennsylvania newspaper, The Miner's Journal, in November of 1891. The Victim of a Toy Mrs. Eugene Carpenter of 221 Myrtle Avenue is insane, a victim of the toy known as Ouija. Mrs. Carpenter, 28, has been receiving the attentions of a young man employed as brakeman on the Consolidated Railroad, and it was their intention to be married this winter or early in the spring. About a week ago, they quarreled over a trifling thing, and a separation followed. As days went on and her lover did not return, Mrs. Carpenter grew more sad and depressed. The other day, she heard some friends telling of the mysterious Ouija and its powers of answering questions regarding the future. That evening, she purchased one, and, inviting a young lady friend to her rooms, they prepared to test it. She put to it the momentous query, whether her lover would ever return, and if he had ceased to love her. 
the mysterious pointer slowly spelled out the words, He has ceased to love you. He will never return. Mrs. Carpenter became deathly pale, and her friend expected that she would swoon. By a strong effort, she regained her composure, and Ouija was put away. Early the following morning, a neighbor went out of his front door and found Mrs. Carpenter dressed in her nightclothes, wandering up and down the street. She was taken home and cared for, but she kept muttering to herself, Ouija said so, and I know it was so. Her physician says the nervous strain over the loss of her lover had broken her down, but it only remained for the mysterious plaything to snap the cord. He expects to bring her reason back by careful nursing. The following year, in August 1892, the San Francisco Chronicle reported on another tragic case in Indiana under the title... A toy that has upset many minds, spiritualists devoted to the Ouija. It is a craze among Eastern believers in the supernatural. Reports from various parts of the country where the Ouija has been taken up show that a number of believers have made their minds upset by the nervous excitement. A recent dispatch from Liberty, Indiana said that John Chapman and his wife a prosperous couple of that town, had gone stark mad because the Ouija demonstrations had overexcited them. Mrs. Chapman is a daughter of a minister living in Cleveland. They had kept their neighbors in state of excitement for two weeks, had imprisoned both their children in their rooms, and had destroyed nearly all their furniture. When the police entered their house, they found Mrs. Chapman cutting circles in the walls of her room, while her husband was doing the same with a scythe. The carpets had been cut into small strips. Knives, hatchets, and other deadly weapons were scattered through the house. Mrs. Chapman told the officers that Horace Greeley had told her through the Ouija to convert the world to Masonic principles. Uh, Horace Greeley was a well-known newspaper editor and politician in New York, so uh, that's an unlikely claim on Mrs. Chapman's part. And then the article ends with this further paranoid tidbit unrelated to the Chapmans. It was only a short time ago that an inventor of considerable repute in New York was found under the mesmeric influence of his wife who had gone crazy over the Ouija and suspected everybody of desiring to poison her. While such problems afflicted mentally fragile Ouija users, other issues beset the Kennard Novelty Company. We don't really know why, but Charles Kennard jumped ship after only 14 months, leaving the wealthy investor Washington Bowie to managed things for Bond, and Bond himself left in 1907. While they were ultimately legally obliterated by Bowie, who now ran the company, both Canada and Bond attempted to sell Ouija knockoffs to little avail, Bond doing so under the unfortunately named Swastika Novelty Company. By 1897, Bowie had leased rights to manufacture the Ouija board to a rising star within management, someone whose name you might remember appearing on Ouija boxes, that is, William Fald. Or actually to William and his brother Isaac, though Isaac eventually was driven from the company after years of bitterly acrimonious legal warfare, it wasn't epic feud that split the family with the two sides not communicating for 96 years. Isaac even is said to have ordered the body of his daughter exhumed from the Fald burial grounds for internment elsewhere. But on to happier matters. William Fald ran the company for 26 years, presiding over a second wave of Ouija mania during the 1920s. He capitalized on this by marketing a number of unlikely Ouija-branded products, including jewelry, shaving mugs, and Ouija oil, said to be an Egyptian remedy. 
ideal for treating sprains, bruises, neuralgia, rheumatism, and so on. This second wave also produced a number of Ouija novelty songs, including 1920s Ouija Mine, and from the same year, Ouija Ouija Tell Me Do, which is spelled like that, Ouija. There have always been two ways to pronounce this name. if there are any surviving recordings of these, but uh, from the sheet music, we have these performances orchestrated by the Talking Board Historical Society in Boston, an invaluable resource on this topic, as is Brandon Hodge's website, Mysterious Planchette. Uh, Both should be of interest to those looking for further detail on the topic. A number of literary works of the period were said to have been created with the aid of the Ouija board, the most famous being those of the Illinois writer Pearl Lenore Curran, who claimed to have channeled the words of a 17th century character by the name of Patience Worth. Writing under that name, Curran produced not only a 17th century biography and related tales, but also time-traveling stories from the medieval period and the Days of Christ. Along with the six novels and hundreds of poems attributed to Patience Worth, there was even a Patience Worth magazine. Curran's Ouija partner, Emily Grant Hutchings, likewise channeled the novel Jap Heron, a novel written from the Ouija board. Hutchings attributed the poorly received book to the recently deceased Mark Twain. And after Frank L. Baum died, his spirit was also dragged out via Ouija transmission to dictate Invisible Inzy of Oz. This 1919 edition to the Oz series was poorly received, but perhaps not so bad, considering it was a pair of siblings, Robert and Virginia Washoe, pages 9 and 13, respectively. Their mother did the typing. As this second wave of Ouija mania hit in the 1920s, more reports of those whose minds had become disordered by its use appeared. Uh, This time also in the Western U.S., as in this short article from the Daily Report of Ontario, California, from March 6, 1920. Ouija board claims two more victims. Martinez, California. Ouija mania claimed another victim here when C.F. Forey, impelled, he said, by suggestions from a Ouija board, hurled a brick through the post office window. Oakland, California. Impelled by the demands of a Ouija board, policeman Elmer H. Dean ran into the street and started to disrobe. Dean, who is from San Francisco, said the Ouija board had told him that a Berkeley man was his enemy and would kill him. He at once started for Berkeley. Then the Ouija board suddenly changed its suggestion to one of clothing and Dean acted accordingly. His sanity will be tested today. And more mayhem from California was reported in March of that year in the Kansas City Post. California town is gripped by epidemic of occultism. El Cerrito, California, March 20th. Ouija mania, a peculiar madness resulting from overindulgence in the little board credited by many with occult instrumentality, has descended heavily upon this little community. Four women victims have been placed in asylums. Several other devotees are under investigation by psychiatrists, and town authorities have issued instructions for a general probe by specialists of what amounts to an epidemic of weird psychic practices. This state of affairs was uncovered in the arrest and incarceration in the state hospital of Mrs. S. Bettini, Mrs. Edward Morrow, Mrs. Josie Soldovini, and Adelini Bettini, after police had broken in barred doors, 
found the occupants in a state of trance and gibbering about dictates from the unseen, which they had followed out through strange rites. Held 24-hour sittings. Day and night the women had hovered over the Ouija board. On two occasions, at least 24-hour sittings had been held. Five children, the youngest two years old, were found confined in the house, used for seances. The children's heads had been shaved, quote, to drive away evil spirits. All were found in poor physical condition and suffering from undernourishment. Neighbors told of their children having been lured into the house. Adeline Bettini, a handsome girl of 15, seemed to have acted as high priestess in the spiritism orgies. It is she who professed to have received most of the messages after she had introduced the Ouija to her family and friends. When the officers arrived and sought entrance, they were told that a passion play was in progress and that the dead husband of one of the women was present and would kill any intruder. Over $700 in bills had been burned, according to Adeline Bettini, to appease the malicious spirits, and for the same reason most of the women's clothing had been destroyed. As mentioned, William Fold presided over the Ouija Novelty Company for 26 years, ensuring that it was his name most strongly associated with the board. His tenure, however, came to an end with an accident in February of 1927. Fold, who was on the roof of his factory overseeing the installation of a new flagpole, put a bit too much weight on a too flimsy support and fell several floors to the ground. His death came soon, but before he went, he extracted a promise from his children never to sell the Ouija company to anyone outside the family. And they didn't. Or at least not until 1966 when they sold to Parker Brothers. Nevertheless, perhaps from the great beyond, William Fold could still take otherworldly satisfaction knowing that for nearly four decades after his death, people would continue to query him about his talking board. While some may have used the planchette, we have better evidence of those who used the U.S. mail. After all, Fold's name was retained post-mortem on widget advertising and packaging, so letters addressed to the deceased businessman continued to arrive at the Baltimore headquarters into the 1960s. A huge number of these were handily archived on the website williamfold.com, and I've chosen one with which to end the show. It's a bit dark. The letter is written by Mrs. M. S. Booten of Kalamazoo, Michigan, dated December 20th, 1918. William Fold, you have sold your life, your soul, your all to the demon of your invention, the Ouija board. I could, and am so strongly tempted to arrest and make you pay me for the things that the devil of your board has done. I am a peace-loving, respectable woman, but for the amusement of our young people was tempted to invest in one of those boards. The company that used it always laughed and had a lot of fun out of it. I looked upon it, and the demon of your invention in that way got hold of me. Night and day, the voice of that devil talked to me. I nearly died. No one knew what was the matter, and I would not believe the awful things or do the wicked things I was told to do, even being told that I would be rewarded beyond measure. I was told to use my front finger on my right hand, and God would tell me what he wanted. I did. 
and my hand flew over the board like lightning, and it told me that he was the devil. I hated to do one thing, which was to go to an adopted daughter and my husband and tell them that I hated them. I knew not why. I was so cold and I felt death staring me in the face. I heard my adopted daughter come in from her home and I was upstairs and thought they will find me dead. But a voice came, go, tell them, go tell them. And I had at last gone down those long stairs, so cold, stiff, and weak. I could hardly go. I found my husband and my daughter playing cards on the Ouija board. I went past them and laid down in the next room. I found I was going into unconsciousness. I, with the greatest effort, got up and walked behind my daughter's chair and told them I was going to die. And then I told them, please, please forgive me. I told my husband and adopted daughter I hated them. I told all. They were frightened nearly to death and thought me insane. You thought I was dying because I looked so terrible. After they begged me to believe they loved me and had nothing to forgive, I sank into her chair for she had gone crying and screaming into the dining room. I could not walk or talk. I was that weak. When the board they had set up by the side of the chair fell on my limb, I kicked it across the room and screamed and screamed and begged of them to burn it. My husband took it to the basement and found it to be a hard job to even smash the devilish thing with an axe. But he did and burned it. I knew I had another upstairs. They didn't. As soon as I could, I went upstairs and threw it into the backyard, came down and silently went for an axe. I went into the backyard, roaming under a free American sky, and with the strength of a man, smashed the board and took it into the basement and put it into the furnace. The price of the two boards, the three weeks of being unable to do my work as an alteration woman at $12 per week, the fact that daily I grew worse, then nearly died, rests on you. A company called Fold. The price of two was and three weeks were total $38.60. And remember this, if you never pay this bill, you will suffer the torments of the damned. And remember, I will, as sure as there as a God in heaven, work to ruin you. I have not yet decided just what to do, but the first thing I have done is to write this to you, and you will suffer as no person or persons has ever suffered. What are you going to do? Please tell me. <laughs>